fresh meat. Let me tell you a little something about love, Dennis. It has a voracious appetite. It eats everything. Friendship, family. It kills me how much it eats. But I'll tell you something else. You feed it right, and it can be a beautiful thing, and that's what we have. And you feel this way about Lee. <laughs> what? F no! Talking about Christine, man! Ah, just imagine it. You're a loser at school who's constantly being bullied. And here comes this car that makes you the coolest guy around, even scoring a hot girlfriend because of it. Only one problem. The car likes to kill people. This is the story of John Carpenter's Christine, and we're diving in to what the f happened to this horror movie. Stephen King's influence on horror cannot be overstated. You'd have to go a long ways before you found someone that didn't know his name. And the 80s were when King was at his absolute peak. Every story he wrote seemed to be made into a movie shortly after. And Christine was no exception. In fact, the film was in production before the book had even been released. Now that is influence. Richard Kobritz had served as a producer on the King miniseries Salem's Lot and had struck up a friendship with the author. Because of this, he was able to gain the film rights to Christine. His first choice for director was actually Halloween auteur John Carpenter. But unfortunately, Carpenter was unavailable as he was committed to both Firestarter as well as The Ninja. After those projects were repeatedly delayed, Carpenter was able to accept the directing job on Christine. Now, despite what the end product wound up being, Carpenter has always referred to the film as simply a job versus a personal project. He had just been coming off of the financial bomb of The Thing, and he was concerned about his longevity in the film industry. While the screenplay does a good job of adapting the novel, there are some considerable changes. Almost all of the deaths in the film have been altered, sometimes due to mere logistical issues, other times opting for a more cinematic approach. Then the major change was the car at the forefront. While the book has the car's former owner, Roland D. LeBay, having possessed his former car, the film indicates that Christine is evil right off the assembly line, even killing one of its workers. While both are interesting, the mystery in the film is far more interesting than an evil former owner wreaking havoc. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie? and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. Look, I'm buying her. I don't care what you say. The story of Christine is a simple one. Arnold Cunningham is a massive loser at school. Despite being best friends with a popular kid, he is always picked on. Until he comes across this beautiful red car that goes by the name of Christine. Almost immediately, Arnie's luck turns around and he's brimming with confidence. But like some terrifying transformer, Christine is more than meets the eye. The car starts killing those around Arnie as it wants him all to itself. So a killer car movie, got it. But where the film really excels is in its tone. I'm sure not many people would refer to horror movies as cozy, but this one is all sorts of cozy. From the total 80s aesthetic to the brisk pacing, this is the epitome of an easy watch. And it may be in part due to the lovable lead at the center. Keith Gordon plays Arnie, and he is the dweeb to end all dweebs. I mean, just look at how awkward his interactions with his mom are. Columbia Pictures asked the filmmakers to cast Brooke Shields and Scott Bayo as the two leads. But thankfully, their request was declined. Originally, Kevin Bacon had auditioned for the role, but had to drop out in order to star in Footloose. Yeah, probably the right career move. But this really would have changed the entire movie. Because while Arnie isn't entirely believable when he enters cool mode, Kevin Bacon would have pulled that off easily. If anything, it would have been interesting to see if he could actually pull off the awkward, nerdy side of the performance. Plus, had Bacon been cast, it wouldn't have been nearly as unbelievable that he's able to score Lee. 
because with Keith Gordon in the role, that quickly becomes the most unrealistic part of this killer car movie. Speaking of Lee, she's played by Alexandra Paul, who happens to be a twin. During filming of the bulldozer scene, her twin sister Caroline stood in for her as a joke, only for Alexandra to walk out, asking Carpenter if she'd been replaced. He had said that he thought there was something different about her, but he just couldn't quite put his finger on it. She looks smart, but she's got the body of a slut. <sighs> oh, the 80s, you gloriously absurd era. Also, how is that the body of a slut? Other prominent 80s actors like Kelly Preston, Harry Dean Stanton, and Robert Prosky appear. You may also recognize Stephen Tash as the guy that Bill Murray electrocutes at the beginning of Ghostbusters, as well as Stuart Charno, who plays the mysteriously disappearing Ted from Friday the 13th Part 2. Again, if you're a fan of the 80s, this movie absolutely oozes it. Which is hilarious because technically the movie takes place in 1978. John Stockwell starred as Arnie's best friend, Dennis, and while he was unknown at the time, he would go on to appear in Top Gun in a minor role, while later shifting gears to directing. His role feels somewhat pointless, as he often covers the same ground as Arnie and Lee, but Stockwell does a good job with it. I also feel the need to mention Robert Blossoms, who has probably the best line in the entire movie. She had the smell of a brand new car. That's just about the finest smell in the world, except maybe for pussy. The movie was filmed almost entirely in Los Angeles, with a garage in Santa Clarita doubling as Darnell's Garage. All of the film's car stunts were performed by stunt coordinator Terry Leonard, including when the car is entirely engulfed in flames. Keith Gordon, however, had much less success with operating the vehicle, constantly having issues with the car's automatic transmission, which was this weird button system. The automobile at the lead is actually a 1958 Plymouth Fury. They were able to purchase 24 cars in various states of disrepair and cobbled them together to make 17 show cars. 1.5 million of the film's $10 million budget was used just on the vehicles for the film, only two of which made it to the end of production. The car was also never made available in the cherry red tone that we see in the film. Instead, the sandstone white that the cars actually came in can be seen in the assembly line during the intro. Okay, show me. The impressive shots of the car restoring itself and putting itself back together were actually done by Roy Arbogast, who had worked with Carpenter on The Thing. I don't need to tell you how awesome the effects are in that movie. Here they used internally mounted hydraulic presses in order to crumple the frame of the car inward, and then the footage was played in reverse. It's extremely impressive, even by today's standards. The soundtrack utilizes popular hard rock from the era. I mean, opening on Bad to the Bone really makes this feel like Stephen King right from the jump. Then add to it the very synthy score by Carpenter and Alan Howarth, and you've got the makings for some musical gold. You may also notice that Christine doesn't have a lot of violence. Most of the deaths are quickly cut away from, and nothing is really shown. Because of this, the filmmakers were worried that the movie wouldn't receive an R rating, and would therefore hurt their box office. In order to counteract this, screenwriter Bill Phillips added a few fucks into the dialogue, and the film was rewarded with an R rating. Now, hey, take your mitts off me, motherfucker! Christine released in the United States on December 9th, 1983, and brought in over $3.4 million on its opening weekend. The movie managed to end its run with a total box office gross of $21 million. With that $10 million budget, it was definitely a success. Roger Ebert even gave the film 3 out of 4 stars, but given how much he seems to hate horror films, that may not be considered a net positive. These films hate women, mm -hmm. and unfortunately the audiences that go to them don't seem to like women too much either. The film has received plenty of love over the years, with its soundtrack being released multiple times as well as constant flows of physical releases like the recent 4K Blu-ray. 
And while the film has avoided the remake train so far, that's about to end, as Brian Fuller is now writing and directing his own version for Blumhouse. Whether that captures the magic of Carpenter's version is anyone's guess, but if anything, let's just hope they reuse that beautiful 1958 Fury. Because, you know. That's just about the finest smell in the world, except maybe for pussy.